Welcome everybody. I'd like to reintroduce Gavin. He's been lectured for us, I think, twice already on various things, 3D printers and his light scythe come to mind. Gavin's an intrepid tinkerer, spends a lot of his time, and a spare time, <laughs> um, building really interesting science projects, basically. And tonight he's coming to show us a few interesting projects about light and the colour spectrum. So, enjoy. And over to you, Gavin. Cheers, Mel. Um, this was a... This is a, nothing formal. This is me getting really interested in seeing puddles by the side of the road and just after rain you get that oily puddle and you get a rainbow and this was sort of an exploration I went through after seeing you get that that beautiful sheen and it's a it's a rainbow but it's actually not the Roy G Biv rainbow it's a different color ordering um, so that sort of kicked this off and basically I'll, there's, there's precisely one set of input data that I got from the real world with this and I'll, I'll show you that but the rest of it is all sort of from first principles and seeing how far I can go just playing around with stuff. Um, so the background of the talk, we're going to be talking a lot about light, going to be talking a lot about colour and that's really uh, ambiguous terminology and confusing. So I'd like to introduce some shoulder angels that we're going to bring with us. And the old cartoons you always had the shoulder angels telling you to do the good and the bad thing or whatever. So our three shoulder angels are a typical human with meaning standard color vision, uh, you know, not necessarily colorblind or anything like that. Uh, we're going to have a talking dog. So another earth creature that has similar absorption functions to a human. Um, and we're going to have an alien that's can see, but just way different than anything else. So with those three shoulder angels with us, we should be able to sort of mentally uh, avoid saying something which is only specific to one, one creature's point of view, if you know what I mean. So I want to I keep that distinction between what's, what's true in physics land and what's true in uh, individual creature perception land. Um, so if I'm saying green, am I talking about the app, the colour of a particular apple on a tree or the output of a particular laser? Um, or the colour from my printer, which was mixed from three different inks, so it's not necessarily a true colour. So the idea I want uh, to get across is to be able to cash out our shorthand words, like colour, uh, in terms of actual experiences or the result of experiments we get. So let's look at a bunch of phenomena in the world um, that I happen to find interesting. And there are some very vivid colours we can find in nature, and I'll show you a few examples. And I wanted to ask, are these the same thing or are these different? First of all, we've got rainbows. So, we've all seen a rainbow. Nice little colour ordering. Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, violet. Um, so I'll put that, I'll, I'll sort of list out the phenomena. Exhibit next, a. sorry? Exhibit A. Exhibit A, yes. So next one is, this is a bolt. Uh, just an ordinary bolt and I hit it with a blowtorch on one side and the steel has oxidized and it's got a beautiful little rainbow sheen and the color as you heat it the the color of the bolt uh, determines the thickness of the oxide layer and you get this beautiful rainbow coloring I'll pass that out if anyone wants to have a look at it so that's sort of one one phenomena and there's a bunch of similar ones titanium anodizing um, so this is just this ordinary slab of titanium, sand it back, and I've actually got a little demonstration here. So this is a, just a blank bit of titanium. I'm just going to pop the paintbrush down for a few seconds. This is a 9 volt battery fresh out of the pack, nothing special at all. What I'm using an electrolyte is, um, what I recommend for this is a Diet Coke. Um, <laughs> and. So if I wipe that off, oh, good yeah, we can actually see there's the, there's the paintbrush mark there. Yep. So it's put an oxide coating on that titanium of a particular thickness which is generating the colour. And if you play around with stacking three variable power supplies together and have a bit of time, you can generate a full rainbow. Um, so this is every few volts. Uh, that's 36 volts, 45 volts, 55, so on and so forth, just adding, I think I was adding 9 volt batteries or something for that one. Um, and you can really get some sort of a gradation of colours 
Oh, according to my notes, that's 2.5 volts to 37.5 volts. So I'll pass those out. It is a plate of metal, so watch out for sharp so edges. It's painting off to make white paint white. Yes, yes. I don't know if that's just a really <laughs> thick... Yeah. But you can... Um, so if you've got titanium uh, mugs or pens or whatever, you can just sand it back and actually apply this. And the colour is just a direct result of the voltage. Um, and as you can see, this is someone's... Uh, reference chart for how to anodize titanium. So this is just hanging on the wall of their shop. And then it's just, okay, I want, you know, the sky blue, so I'm going to set it at 17 volts. So, yeah. It's, it's literally that simple. Um, there's another related phenomena where we see these sort of rainbow colors is birefringence and stress patterns. So, if wearing polarized sunglasses or something like that, yeah, flexing the ruler. Going back forward. Yeah. If you've uh, seen a so there's, there's the anodized titanium. So I'll add that to our list of phenomena. Uh, we've got birefringence. Uh, if you've worn polarized sunglasses and looked through at the rear view mirror and the, the rear windscreen is typically, uh, what do they call it, safety glass or something. So it has all these really big stress patterns and it looks like a technicolor yawn. Um, that's because of birefringence induced by stress in the glass. So we can see this, this protractor here has a whole big stress concentration there. And we'll go through why that happens in a sec, but this is just adding, adding a phenomenon on our list of uh, uh, things to, to think about. Um, so what causes the actual rainbow, first of all? Um, we've got the break, breakdown of white light into colours, and Newton showed that white light is actually made up of all the different colours, and we have something like a prism or a diffraction grating that splits it out and does a sort of spatial transform on it and separates it. So. Uh, Humans perceive different wavelengths as different colours. So, yeah, this is nothing new. Obviously, we're just going to cash out the idea of colours as wavelengths or mixtures of wavelengths. Um, so, so far, well, let's have a round table with our shoulder angels. We'll project a rainbow onto the floor and we'll say, okay, for the sake of argument, we're going to call this point blue and this point yellow and this point green and so on and so forth. So we can get some names and so far, everyone agrees. Maybe they're not the same names that they use all the time, but so far, everyone agrees. Let's get human specific for a second. And, uh, Doesn't the talking dog actually see different colour? Yes, but, it, but it, it agrees that the rainbow progresses in a particular order, right. and, we can, and we can say for the sake of argument, we're going to call that one uh, a particular colour. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's, that's how we can cash out the, the dog's experience in terms of physical phenomena. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and any, any creature with a, a colour vision system should be able to put the rainbow in a particular order and have that order be correct, if you know what I mean. As long as you haven't got one photoreceptor or something. Human, human vision is made up of three photoreceptors. There's actually a fourth one, but in daylight vision, the fourth one shuts down and essentially we've just got these three channels here. Uh, it's from around 400 nanometers to around 700-ish. Anything else is in what we call UV or infrared, so humans can't see that. Um, so we, uh, these are the three channels that humans actually can perceive. This was an interesting regression. I'm like, okay, this is cool. How do we know this? And I found the one of the the papers where they sort of found this out the hard way. And I have so much more respect for this graph now after finding out what they actually went through to get it. <laughs> Um, so this is, a, this is a paper, it's Bowmaker and Dartnell, 1980, if I'm honest to find it. It's a, a, quite a dramatic story. So they had a patient, obviously had two eyes, one of them had a malignant melanoma. Um, uh, radiotherapy failed, the eye had to come out. Obviously they're not going to use it after that point. Um, so they amputated the eye um, and then sent it off to the university to do tests. But the proteins in the eye are going to denature under visible light. So you know, with the patient agreeing to, uh, you know, pass on their eye when they're finished with it. The evening before the operation, they had to wear a light tight bandage, um, which was not removed until afterwards. The actual operating theatre itself, the entire thing was done under darkroom conditions with particular filters over the lighting. The surgeon had to operate in uh, extreme uh, red conditions that wouldn't denature any of the proteins. The eye was removed, uh, put on uh, ice, courier to the university where it had to be dissected and put into a, a spectrophotometer to measure uh, points on the curve. As time is going on, 
the eye is just degrading by itself. So it's a race against time. They have a special a cooling solution. They have a special solution to keep it at uh, osmotic pressure of inside the human body so it doesn't degrade. Um, the dissection itself, they couldn't use visible light to, to cut up the eye and the thing. So they had to have night vision scopes pointing at this thing and the, the, um, the person in the university dissecting it had to, to use a, a image intensifier night vision setup and very carefully cut it into four different pieces, feed it into the apparatus one by one, and you get these quite noisy graphs which were they will then able to infer the, the true shape from. So a lot of people went through a lot to get this graph. Um, I have a huge amount of respect for it now. Um, this one also shows the, the extra one, the night vision thing, which I think that one. Um, anyway, back, back to the investigation. Um, in normal daylight vision, humans have access to three channels of information. Uh, I'm going to call them the long, medium, and short wavelength receivers. I'm specifically not calling them red, green, and blue um, because so each of these each of these receivers can be tickled different amounts uh, by light. I'm not calling them red, green, and blue because if we jump back to here, this is not quite that other graph, but it's it's effect. This is what happens when an international standard committee gets a hold of that graph and, <laughs> and standardizes it. So it's it's a CIE illumination diagram as opposed to the actual biological data, but it's essentially the same thing. The reason why I'm, I'm going to call these long, medium, and short instead of red, green, and blue is that if we feed in 550 nanometer light, it tickles the green one perfectly, and it's still tickling the red to more than 50% activation. So it's, it's incorrect to call this a red receptor when it also fires for green. And blue. And blue, yeah. And so you can see there's a red peak in there. So this is why I'm going to call them long, medium, and short. Um, this is also a bit of a hack. There's technically an inhibitory function, and they've just scaled it up and blah, blah, blah. International committees had their way with it. Um, so, yeah, the, the green light actually tickles the uh, long receptor, so I'm going to call it long instead of red. Our brain has to infer everything about colour just from these signals. There's no other source of information for this. Um, it can use signal, clever signal processing, but the only information source is these three channels. So, I really hate to do this, and I don't know if, if introducing this has ever made any discussion better, but Plato's cave. Um, the idea that everyone's, uh, you know, human perception, everyone's stuck in the cave and they can just see the shadows on the walls and uh, the true reality is out here, but we're only seeing this dim perception of it mediated by our senses. So what is, what is our brain actually dealing with? So here's an example that I've generated uh, of a bunch of common objects. And this is the three long, medium, short being tickled different amounts. So this is all our brain can actually deal with. Um, what would we do if we wanted to uh, say a di diabolical philosopher locked you in a room with only these three channels of information? What would Alan Turing do? Uh, collect huge amounts of data. Let's get as many samples as possible, see if we can look for patterns, see if we can come up with simpler rules that describe it. Uh, so collect a whole bunch of data. Okay, here's you know, 30 typical objects. Um, and we can see that there's some little bit of sort of patterns with these. It may not be, be apparent, but these two tiny, tend to go together. If, if one is up, the other tends to be up. The top and the bottom don't really go together that much, but the top two tend to go together a little. Another way to do it, if we could just plot these as three, so we've got long, medium, and short, let's call that three dimensions, we'll do a three-dimensional scatter plot of it. And it looks like this. And it's this sort of spirally cone shape and it's, it's difficult to infer much from it but it's sort of there's a trend to the data it's, it's following this shape so is there a way to compress this three-dimensional thing down into a two-dimensional thing what can we get out of that all right um, let's look for correlations um, so long and medium tend to fire together and if these are up then this tends to be down up down up, down, up, down. So there's an inverse correlation between those two. So let's mix long and medium together and call that one channel and plot that versus that. That's one way to do it. 
Um, and another way we could do it is look for the difference between, though and call, between these two and call out another axis. What's, what's the input, though, for each of those four? A, a pure spectral colour. Right. So we could call out a laser or something like that. Can you tell Not, us which one's are, like, which one's red? Oh. I think this was random. This one is actually in spectral order. Wait a sec. Uh, this one is spectral order going from... Long, medium to short. Yeah. Yes. So that's blue now. It might be doing a circle, I can't remember which, yeah. but yeah. Um, so if we look at some rough patterns, we can, we can make a guess at how to slice it. Uh, and if we do this, um, so we, we, the top two channels were long and medium, and we said that could be one axis. So we can call this a green versus red as a dimension, and we can call this blue versus yellow. There's no yellow receptor, but if you have a 50-50 mix of uh, uh, long and medium, then you, that's, that's equivalent to a spectral yellow. And as, as soon as we do that, we squished our three-dimensional thing down into this two-dimensional thing, which um, has made it much easier to deal with, and it immediately starts looking like an artist's colour wheel. Um, so what we can look at is, we've got red and green here, we've got blue and yellow here, but as we go around the circle, it tends to be colour opposites. Mm. So this is a very, a very valid smooshing of the data. Um, we haven't lost anything really by going from that three-dimensional shape down to this two-dimensional shape. You're just defining opposites there. Absolutely, absolutely. And all, all this is is just, is just opponent colour theory, um, but looking at the data and, and correlations and uh, to, to choose that axis of, of what way would you slice it from 3D to 2D. Um, and then it looks very much like Goethe's colour wheel. Where you've got opposite sides of colour opposites. Um, so I'm, I'm was tickled pink to just like get to this point, just kind of from first principles. Um, yeah, this is nothing that hasn't been done before, but it was just really, really cool that when you feed, all I fed into the, the um, Python was that graph out of the eyeball, and then we can make this beautiful scatter plot that's almost a, a perfect circle, um, is, is quite, uh, quite appealing. So there's this concept of um, these three channels come into the brain, um, there's this concept of metamers. So a neurotypical human has three channels. To make an object look the same, you only have to tickle the three channels in the same way, not make a perfect spectral match for every piece of data. Um, so for example, if we had a couple of lasers pointing at something, we could adjust the intensity of the lasers to make the illumination look correct, rather than having to spectrally match every single object with 10,000 lasers. Um, might be a bit uh, uh, abstract, but I'll, the next slide should make it easier. This, this, this idea of metamers, this, this uh, different wavelength combinations that generate the same stimulus, allow us, it's what allows us to make simplified technology like printers, cameras, and monitors, where you only have to have three inks in your printer, you don't have to have 10,000 inks. Um, whereas if we had more sensitive eyes, that would be off the table. Unlike modern spirit spectrum radio systems that try and fill up this yeah. bandwidth. So there's, a, there's another type of camera you can make called a hyperspectral camera that instead of having a red, green and blue filter, so these red, green and blue filters, this is extremely human specific. These values have been chosen to match the uh, CIE illumination curves that we saw earlier. So a, a camera is actually an extremely human uh, centric device. It doesn't appear that way and we don't think of it that way, but it actually is. So the camera, and then the monitor, because it's fed the RGB data from the camera, and we want it to display what we think is a true replica, is also an extremely human-specific device. So well, if we... Probably to go out of shit. Probably to go so, out of so, shit. The, the colours aren't right. Yes, exactly that. So this is the humans bought a brand new printer, and there's a banana on the table, and they've taken a photo of the banana and printed it out, and the human goes, it's a perfect match. The colour rendition is, oh, it's amazing. It absolutely matches. And I was like, I can see a difference, it's close. And the aliens, you're crazy. This is, so maybe for an alien, you'd have to use a different sensing device and then a whole bunch of different inks. Um, this, is, this is where these absorption functions, being different, can show up in, in different ways. Uh, humans don't have very big gaps in our absorption. There's, there's not really any gaps, but there's, there's areas where we're much more sensitive uh, to, to wavelength differences than others. So we can see... Uh, we, we have yellow acuity, which is much, much better than our sort of mid-blue to green acuity. Mm, but was that 
two lines came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you sort of did the first derivative of, of the, that 3D shape as you move across, it's going to change dramatically mm. and we're going to be much more sensitive sort of here and here. Whereas the dog might have its absorption function somewhere else and it might be able to, to pick the difference between apples or something much, much better than we can because we don't happen to see those colours as, as especially different or vivid. Um, so let's jump back to the phenomena. So the phenomena we saw before, the, uh, the, uh, inter the uh, um, anodizing and the rainbows and things, are they the same thing or are they different? So we'll split up into two categories. First we've got the spectral rainbow. So this is rainbow in the sky, or from a prism or a diffraction grating or something like that. We get the, the, the classic Roy G. Biv ordering. And we get another type which is uh, interference rainbows. And these are caused by anywhere you've got a thin coating on top of something else, um, where you have light can bounce off the coating or can go... Uh, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll come to that in a sec. Um, and these sort of... None, none of these phenomena that uh, we look at have Roy G. Biv ordering. They've all got a different ordering. So what's happening with the second category? This is the interesting one. It's an interference effect. So, for example, the steel bolt. There's a tiny, tiny little oxide layer on the steel and part of the light is going through that oxide layer and then bouncing off. And so it recombines. And whenever that extra path difference there is an integer multiple of the, the wavelength of the light, it'll reinforce constructively and the light can, can bounce off. And whenever it's a half integer multiple, it'll uh, interact destructively and the light will get absorbed. Um, so it's, it's this incredibly wavelength specific, incredibly thickness specific effect um but it's uh it's so very very repeatable or something yeah yeah and, and it's precisely based on the wavelength itself okay so science isn't just hand waving and saying this is probably why something happened we need to stick our necks out and actually do some prediction on this one um if these are really if all these phenomena are just light of various wavelengths interfering what we actually predict um, as an example, I'm going to take blowing bubbles. We've all seen you blow the bubble and you get a beautiful rainbow machine on it. Um, that's caused by exactly the same, exactly the same effect, except the either light can bounce back and get reflected, or it can go through and get transmitted. So the bubble's not made of steel. Yeah, exactly, the bubble's not made of steel. But the part of the with the steel. So this is a lovely blue about there. Um, but the light that's shining on it is not blue, it's white, so some of the colours have got to go somewhere else. And they're actually getting absorbed by the steel. But the blue light isn't getting absorbed by the steel, so I see it as blue. So we'll stick our neck out and do prediction. What happens if we fire a single wavelength of light at a bubble, and we vary the bubble thickness, the wall thickness, what happens? You get this really classic interference pattern, where, so say we had a, I think it was a 200 nanometer laser, and we fired at it whenever the uh, if the thickness of the bubble is zero, we get 100% transmission, and as it increases, it, it drops out to nothing, back to 100, drops out to nothing, back. So the thicker your bubble gets, it'll appear to get light dart, light dart, light dart, and actually, this is why you get a, a sort of rainbow sheen down the side of the bubble, because the bubble in the ring sort of tapers like that, so it, it'll actually, it'll have a varying thickness all the way down, and sometimes it'll, it'll appear to reinforce, and sometimes it'll appear to cancel out. Let's do a prediction for multiple wavelengths. We get a much more complicated pattern. Um, so if our bubble has an extra thousand nanometer path delay, it's not the thickness, but it's essentially the same thing. At a thousand nanometers, we've got a bit of red, we've got a bit of blue, and we've got a lot of green. So that would mix together, and a bit of red, a bit of blue, a lot of green is a, a sort of Dirty, brown. dirty, yeah, yeah. That's cancellation or, or perspective or. So this is transmission. There'd be another one which is reflection, which would just be one minus this, and the two beams would add together to give one. Yeah, yeah right. But yeah. I mean, off the off the steel, is it that yeah. there's light being absorbed, and there probably is. But yeah. It seems to me that the blue is more because the blue is what's the reflective layer from the surface of the oxide is. Adding to the reflective layer from the under the oxide from the middle. It is, um, but it's that's that's why the blue reflects. But that's not, that's what I'm saying that's not actually an absorption phenomenon. That's a that's a constructive interference. Um, if you think about it, in the bubble, the bubble will reflect some and transmit some. But it will reflect off both surfaces. Yes, 
but if it, if it reflects off both and they cancel out, then it doesn't reflect. And if it reflects off both and they reinforce, then it, uh, it does reflect. So it's actually, uh, it, it actually becomes like a quantum phenomenon and you can do it with a single photon and, and yeah, yeah, it's, um, it, it is inherently a quantum thingy. Um, a little bit confusing at the moment, I'll, I'll but the, the, the main takeaway is that... So you're changing it because you're measuring it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're interested in this, this exact thing, um, uh, the physicist Richard Feynman's got a book called QED, um, explaining, and he explains how as you increase the thickness of a piece of glass, the reflection goes between, I think, 0 and 16% or something. Um, but the, the, it's inherently the photon is going both ways and recombining, and when, it, when it's got a phase this way and a phase this way, they cancel out and there's nothing, and when it's reinforcing, you get a phase that way, and we in interpret that as the photon is reflecting. So um, I'll, I'll stay away from that for now, but it is essentially a quantum phenomena, and we could actually do... I'll, I'll show some things in a minute and, and map how that uh, becomes a bit quantum-y. Um, so if we looked at... Uh, so this is uh, transmitting through a bubble when the thickness is zero, it's going to be white light that's transmitted, fantastic. Um, so the thickness of the bubble is, is pretty close to zero here. Um, and we're setting sort of a, a whitish pattern there. Is that a photograph of a bubble? That is a, that is a, a very enlarged photograph of a, a bubble, yes. Yeah. This might be a reflective one, actually. So the, the air bubbles there would be the true zero thickness one. But yeah, I'll, I'll stay out of that one for now. And we'll, we'll show how we get these colours in a sec. Um, and where... Okay, so at this point here, at an extra, you know, 2,000-ish nanometers of path delay, the red and the blue are really high and the green is really low, so that's going to show up as a purple. Um, and that's great, and we can, we can plot this for all different wavelengths, but the difficulty is that human eye is not sensitive across all wavelengths. So this interference is going to attenuate some wavelengths of light and not others. Cool. But say the, you know, our soap bubble lets through 10% of 450 nanometers light, which is bluish light, and it allows 90% of 680, which is like sort of, it's red getting close to infrared. We'd think that it's going to look more red than it will blue, but in actual fact, uh, it'll still look quite blue because human eye is, is really, really bad at, at seeing 680 nanometer light and really, really good at seeing 450 nanometer light. So we can't just look at what the the sine waves are saying there. We have to sort of take into account the sine waves, and we also need to take into account the human specific factors. I forgot to mention before, this is the this is a 3D printed graph of the three-dimensional structure, mm -hmm. how much each one. This is the true spectral rainbow, and this is long, medium, and short receptors, and how much they're tickled by each photon. So I'll just pass those out if you want to have a look at them. So we need to have, our prediction needs to include the sinusoidal repeating pattern, and it also needs to weigh based on how good humans are at perceiving each color. So there's a, a human-centric human thing in there. So let's look at it as sort of a, a, a graph where we've got wavelength as one axis and we've got path delay as another axis, like this. So if this is wavelength starting at zero, zero wavelength doesn't really exist, but you know, so human vision goes between about 360, 700, maybe 400, depending on where you, where you draw it. So this is human vision. And this is the amount of path delay we've got. And we know that whenever it's, uh, whenever it's equal, it's going to reinforce. So this is going to be a very bright peak. And this is going to be a very dark peak where it's got a, a cancellation effect occurring. Um, so this is half the story. And we need to include human eye absorption functions. So uh, what we can do is combine these two things together and make one 3D model, which is this. So, yeah. And this is quite cool because it, it shows all the phenomena in one, one object. Uh, so if we put, remember this graph here started at zero, um, and all of these, the, the, first, the first interference combining there is there and the the second one is there and so we have these sort of radial features coming through and you can see that these waves 
are sort of all out. yeah from this origin here so if we put our camera or our eye right there and look down it we see nothing but a perfect sinusoid in that 3d shape and if we put our eye at the bottom there we see the human eye absorption function and the shape is just the combination of the two just a piecewise multiplication of each thing uh, that's got a slightly different shape because I fucked up my original 3D model and it missed a peak but just pretend there's an extra peak there and then so we can see for let's say we had 500 nanometer path delay so a, you know, I don't know, medium thickness bubble uh, then we're going to let through the blue the green and some of the red and we're getting up with sort of a bluish white there and we can see the tristimulus values of the long, medium, short receptors there. So this, this one thing tells you everything there is to know about seeing, uh, for neurotypical humans, seeing the colors from the, uh, from the bubbles. So I'll pass these ones out. That's, one for a dog and an alien. I can make one for a dog and an alien. That's the whole point. <laughs> that's... But, Anyone can make an alien one. That's it. wrong. <laughs> ah, we can predict that. So, you need one for a bird who can see UV. Yes. Well, so this is, where, this is where it gets interesting because we picked... Well, the only input to this was the first principle stuff and that one graph where they dissected the eyeball and they found out you know, what makes it tick. Um, and that was... Ah, yeah. So the, oh, I forgot to mention, that's why that, that's why that guy was such a golden opportunity. I'm very sad he had to lose his eye. But it, the, it had cancer, it was coming out anyway. He was alive afterwards. It's not a cadaver. Like, <laughs> you can interview him, and he had two eyes, and you can, you can show him Ishihara plates and make him identify them. And they verified that uh, you know, he'd, he'd uh, uh, done color blindness testing beforehand, done color blindness testing afterwards. He was sort of you know, unremarkable, had great color perception. Um, so it was this golden opportunity, as opposed to most, uh, I guess, medical parts that end up in a university uh, where you can't necessarily ask them a bunch of pointed questions about it. It was, yeah. <laughs> so they, yeah, they went through a lot to get that one graph. It was, it's quite amazing. Um, okay, so the 3D model is cute, but that doesn't help us predict. We really need to calculate the tristimulus values, um, which is the, the amount of tickling in each of those three channels, and that's the right-hand side on the graph there, so you can see those three curves. So let's we calculate the tristimulus values uh, and figure out what it, what it looks like uh, as the bubble increases in, in thickness. And it looks like this. So it starts off white and then it goes sort of brown, then black, and then blue, then yellow, and so on and so forth. And then it, interestingly it just sort of devolves to red, green, red, green after that. If we take the zoomed in photo of the bubble, this is actually a pretty good match for uh, mm, might have a better photo of that but there's another option I'll show you in a second but we can see the progression of colors is looking extremely similar to, to what we've just calculated from first principles here so question um, if the we've got our bubble wand and we just pulled it out and we've got a particular part that's showing a, a nice green color but it was illuminated with a, a white light. So where is that other light? Where, where is the rest of it gone? Green has come out, but some of that light is missing. And the answer is some of it was reflected and some of it was transmitted. So the person on the other side of the bubble is seeing a completely different color. So we need to work out what the tristimulus values for those are. <laughs> and it's this. So some light's transmitted, some is reflected through, through our soap bubble. And there's a really interesting pattern here. Um, so we've got our two graphs. Let's we'll call the first one transmitted. White, black, sort of whitish, blackish. Can anyone else see it? There's, a, there's another distinct. It's, along. it's not shifted along. It looks like it's shifted along. It's. it's um, with this ordering, it does. Actually, let me hand out. There's a couple more here. You can compare the two. This is this is the the marvels of Kodak color printing, as opposed to uh, my my computer and the projector's attempt at rendering the color. It's not just a shift. Um, if we move it across, we can see there's actually a bit of a, a bit of a distinction between them. Oh, okay, okay. So the white, the white, and the black. So that goes white, black, and then to blue. Whereas this goes black, white, and then into brown. So there's a difference there. Cool. Anyone else want to take a... There's, there's one really dominant pattern 
across this. And it took me a while to figure out, but um, I sort of had a holy shit moment when I realized it. Anyone have a crack what the uh, difference is? Something about the speed? No. Oh, where it's blue, if that rocks are blue. Yes. Any, any advance on that? <laughs> any advance on that? What's the colour opposite, of, what's the color opposite of blue? Yeah, yellow? Red, yeah. Yellow. Blue, yellow. Blue, yellow. Blue, yellow. Mm. Uh, colour opposite of red? Green? Mm. I'll show us how we can test this as well. Oh. Where's, a, where's a good red? Red, green, red, green. So at every stage along this thing, we're seeing colour opposites. Yeah. And if we think about it intuitively, that makes sense because yeah. the white light contained both and we've split it into two chunks yeah. and whatever's not in one has got to be in the other. Yeah. But, Conservation of light. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, it, yeah, it literally is. If you, if you wanted to phrase it in quantum terms, it would be conservation of squared modulus. Um, or R RMS if you're for radio people. You could draw that with the 1970s and 1980s colour schemes, are Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. She looks like a bathroom artist. <laughs> <That's, laughs> so what's interesting about this, though, is... Um, so uh, the humans all looked at that and we all went, okay, great, yep, they're colour opposites. And we, we found, we sort of went along at four or five different points and yep, they're colour opposites. That actually is a really universalizable observation. So if we check in with our shoulder angels, are they always opposite? Yep, yep, yep. And so it doesn't matter that that light is, is ripped in half and the different uh, beings might go, well, that's a different colour or it might map to a different portion of the rainbow because their, their eyes happen to point at one particular area uh, and found it more dominant than another or something like that. But whatever um, whatever observational structure, they, whatever the, the absorption functions are in the eye, they're going to agree that those two things add together to give white. Um, so it's really, you, you wouldn't be able to share, a, share a, um, a house with an alien because you'd never agree on a paint scheme and you never, you never agree that the yellow paint you bought was the same yellow as the banana that's on the counter. Um, because the paint is, is a mixer of, uh, of different uh, colours instead of a true spectral yellow from a, a laser. Um, but so you can agree that the bubbles... Out and my wife's an alien. Yeah, that's right. Quite possible. <laughs> quite possible. <laughs> that's... Could you not get... Yeah. Could you not, I don't know, get orga inorganic metal salt pigments and actually measure the yeah. wavelengths and actually form a match using You different... absolutely could. Um, and, but you need to use a lot more than three, making, three inks or... Making, say, 100 peaks across the... Exactly, exactly. And, and this is why... Um, th this is back to that concept of metamers. And, you, and because we've only got three channels, you can fake it really easily, which is great, which is why we have cameras, which is why we have printing, because it takes very little energy to fake it. Whereas if you had... If your, your projector, instead of having an RGB mix, had to have an RGB, you know, like right, right. a thousand or... Yeah, it had to have a hundred different lasers in there instead of three different, uh, you know, LEDs or whatever. It'd be much, much harder than make printing technology. It's interesting because, yeah. you know, white, white LED lights are not especially... Yes. Consistent. Yes. And so they probably don't look white to gold, for example. That's it. And, and there'd be gaps, and depending on what you're illuminating, uh, the pigments... Like, if we're used to thinking of something as a very light object and it had a very particular absorption function or whatever, then, then you might put it under different lighting and, and it appears darker than it would under some other lighting. Does or this also, this yeah. also can relate to the, the thing used in the lighting industry called the colour rendering index? Exactly so, exactly so. Um, so if, jump back to the... So this is my half-assed attempt at making the, the, the CIE diagram, but the true CIE diagram is, a, is exactly this. It's, it's a smooshing of this data this three-dimensional data of the tri-stimulus down to a two-dimensional thing. Um, the CAE function from 1956, 1965, something along those lines, is basically just a, uh, like a linear smooshing and it looks like a horseshoe. And if you've ever bought a new monitor and it's come with a color calibration certificate, you get that sort of horseshoe diagram on it. Um, uh, but basically, it's, it's, it's this, but done a little bit better, and also done by an international committee. Uh, so it's, but the, the CIE diagram itself is uh, the horseshoe on the outside of it is pure spectral stuff. So you could find one single laser that made that color. 
and at the end of it you have red and blue and there's no pure spectral purple um, there's you know sort of I don't know, there, there's no or magenta perhaps is a better thing um, there's, there's no laser that you can get that shines magenta whereas you can mix paint that looks magenta because it's got a mixture of red and blue in it and so there's this the horseshoe there's a dotted bit across there but the color rendering index you're talking about and the, and the, the light temperature is in the middle of the, that horseshoe and um, it's where the, the white starts to form and there's a sort of a, uh, a line on it as, as the, the temperature of the light source increases. So that's, that's where the, the idea of the color rendering index comes in and, and it's how close it is to sort of a, an ideal thermal body. So if you get a blowtorch and heat a piece of steel, it'll eventually start glowing um, and it glows with a very particular... Um, uh, an spectral spread. Exactly, like yeah. Yes, yeah. It's it's not even, it's got a hump, but yes, it's a, um, but it's, okay. it's, it's a very defined hump um, according to Wine's law Whereas with a peak in it. like a, a, a triphosphor fluorescent tube has a red, green and blue peak. Yes. And if you've got a paint that has a, a peak between those, it may look Yes, black. and, it, and it, may, it may kind of fluoresce maybe or... Uh, maybe black. Yeah, exactly. Well, what is yeah. that whole thing under 13 vapor light too? Yeah, How that's it. How weird under yeah. It's it's a it's a really narrow thing that yeah. it generates some and colors yeah. That would normally be a bright color, just dull. Yes. Or something in yeah. Thirty And that's if it's effectively like it's a little laser source that's uh, you it's know. Very close to monochromatic. Mm. I should bring I should bring another thing. Anyway. Um, okay, so where does the other light go? So we've got we've got a vivid agreement from our shoulder angels that each of these are the the same color. Um, let's test that idea. So we've, we've got a great, a great thing which has, has come out as colour opposites according to the Kodak company. Um, but say, say we had some skeptics said, oh, well, how do we know that blue and yellow are actually colour opposites? Um, you want to test this idea. Um, and uh, Young, Tom, Thomas Young, the, um, the scientist, had a beautiful way of doing that, which was a spinning top. And so I've got these two colours which have been selected from there. And if I spin that, instead of looking blue and brown, it actually gets sort of a grey colour with, with no excess. So there are ways to, to test that idea of colour opposites using only sort of 18th century technology, um, just with the idea of a spinning top. So I've got a few of those if anyone wants to play around with it and really test me on, test me on whether these things are actually colour opposites or not. There's a few, uh, few examples there. Um, side note, if anyone's interested in history of, of colour and, and people making pigments and, and things like that, there's a, a beautiful machine from, I think, Data Colour, um, and they sold, like, um, paint, paint testing apparatus and, and colours and, and just sort of provided colour service to people. And the idea of that they had this thing where you could bring along your, uh, bring along your sample and see how it looked next to this colour or, or match your colours or whatever. And rather than having a bunch of known lighting, what they had was a spinning disc with six different motors inside it with a bunch of high-speed slip rings. And it was just color wheels like that um, with a few different primaries. And they could, rot the, the, the discs would rotate inside one another. So you could, by changing the dials on the front, you could change the amount of visible one of each color. And the entire thing spins at about 10,000 RPM. So there's no, it just blends the colors together. And you can play with the dials and mix up and figure out exactly what proportions of each thing line up and match your, match your little colour sample that you bought from home and put next to the monitor. Um, and it was, it was a beautiful thing. It was completely passive and you could put it on a different illumination and see if it matched all across the board. But because the way they were doing it was this mechanical thing, it needed like you know, 10 different high-speed slip rings, a whole bunch of motor encoders, a whole bunch of all this stuff, and spinning around at like 10,000 RPM. Um, it's, it's this gorgeous bit of equipment. Needed to be adjusted on a daily basis. I think so, yeah, it was. <coughs> okay, so young spinning tops. Great to actually check our ideas about uh, color, um, uh, color opposites actually being opposites. Uh, what are some applications for interference effects? Literally everything. Every, every lens, every monitor, every, every uh, iPhone, whatever, uh, rely on various interference effects to work properly. Um, it might be at a deep level or it might be at a, a superficial level. Um, but I'm going to pick some nifty examples and, uh, that uh, may not be obvious. 
So first of all, dichroic filters. Um, so if you look through this, this is actually out of a, a they sell these on eBay as defective cubes uh, from and camera? from from projectors. Um, and so apparently this is, this is combining RGB to, to make a projector thing. It might be out of a camera, but I think they've, they've sort of gone away from that these days. Apparently the process isn't perfect. So um, there's a whole bunch of these defective things on eBay and they're absolutely gorgeous and they'll split light. So that sort of looks greeny and kind of bluey there. I'll, I'll pass around and let people play with it, but I've got a little light here and you can see that basically what happens is it's a, a very thin interference, a very thin uh, coating on there which produces an interference pattern and reflects uh, light one way, no, reflects one wavelength one way and then reflects another wavelength another way and passes through a third wavelength. Are they, are they coatings, um, I've seen this close up and mm. there's diagonals. That yeah. Are they coatings in that diagonal? Or they yes. Yep. Yep. So they, they, they cut it in. It's a cube. They cut it in half, coat one side, put it back together, make a cube, cut it in half again. So it ends up with two different coatings in an, in an X shape um, of, of so different the thicknesses. Is on the outside, no, the, the coatings are buried in the, the buried in the middle. Yeah. Yep. There might be a little anti-reflective coating or something on the outside, but it's it's sort of incidental to the main effect. Yeah. Um, so I, I use these things to make what I call a confuser scope. Um, <laughs> it allows you to experience the joy of RGB misalignment in real life. It's guaranteed to piss off any graphic designer or a printing technician or anything like that. And uh, it's just three of these cubes put together so that the red, green, and blue will come through three different wavelengths. So if I hold that up, we can actually see red, green, and blue. I don't know if that's easy to see. I'll pass it around. You can have a look through it, and you can sort of twist the edges like that and uh, and you can change the, the alignment of it. So very similar to a, color t a CRT colour TV that's malaligned. Yes, or, or had a magnet nearby or, uh, yeah. Um, I just had those laying around. I'm like, that'd be a cute thing to do. And, you know. Sorry? Bragging guns on a CRT. Yes, yeah. Um, so that's dichroic filters. Oh, yeah. Um, one nifty thing about dichroic filters, if you're, if you're ever using them for, for camera stuff or other things, is because there's that coating um, that's, that's actually providing the effect, uh, you can actually tweak these, tweak the wavelength of these. Even though it's made in a factory under extreme clean room conditions and given you know, this, this many nanometers of coating, you can actually tweak the wavelength uh, just by tilting it a little bit. Um, and you can see it on my lamp here, uh, it'll turn around and you'll see the color will actually change. So it's going from uh, orange to yellow now as it sort of sweeps around. And the reason the, the color changes is that from the light's point of view, the effective thickness of that coating has changed. Because when it was lined up, it's as thin as it can possibly get. And when it's on the edge, it's got to go through, from the light's point of view, an effectively deeper layer. Yeah. So if you ever got a dichroic filter and it's not quite the one you, you're after, consider just turning it a little bit and seeing if that helps. Um, Yes. Um, so if you've got a, it would still make it thicker, but yes. <laughs> Turn the other thing the other way, I don't know. Um, another application of uh, interference effects, metalworking. Oops. Um, so when you heat steel up, it gets that oxide. The, the oxide is actually directly related to the temperature. Uh, so blacksmiths can use this to figure out exactly how hot it got um, and, and control their tempering process accordingly. Um, so it's actually, it's a really, really nice, extremely low budget way to, to figure out how hot a piece so of uh, steel is. Grinding cutting tools. Yeah. Um, you've got carbon steel or some sort of tool steel. Yep. If it goes blue, cool it down, <coughs> and it off, but it's not going to be Yeah, hard. yes. You know, if it's a nice draw color, it's fine. That's... Once it goes blue, it's gone too far. Nice. That's like the, the Damascus steel daggers. It was in, in the Middle Ages, they had the, the Damascus steel. This is amazing steel. It was, was more strong than anything else. And they couldn't replicate it. And any time they took the Damascus steel dagger and they heated it up in the forge, it made it useless. Valerian so they could, Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's like, the, like the, yeah. But um, yeah, it was, they, they couldn't replicate it. And, and they knew that if they got it too hot, it'd just break. So yeah. Um, uh, another application is mineralogy. Um, often you want to identify some material and you can do that via birefringence. Um, so if you look at, you got your rock, and if you look at it through cross polarizers, just a pair of sunglasses uh, in front of a monitor or whatever, uh, you, you know, the rock, 
this transparent rocks looking kind of orangey. Um, and then you can get a, uh, there's a scale of, of how many nanometers uh, of extra path length will cause various colors, but the trouble is there's more than one orange peak there. So just knowing that it's orange isn't very helpful. So gemologists have what they call a calibrated one order plate that they can just drop on top. Uh. And that gives them a second color. And then that gives them sort of a quadrature thing where they can look at where that and that are opposite by, uh, offset by exactly one, mm. one order plate, 400 nanometers or whatever. Yeah. Trouble is that's a very expensive thing to buy. Um, here's another application material science, you want to identify plastics. Uh, a lot of plastics, we saw the ruler before, generates a bunch of birefringence when it's stressed. Um, we can use a calibrated one order plate, but they're expensive. It's much easier to use multiple layers of the same plastic. So you, if you've got a plastic film, whatever, you can just fold it. So this would probably work a treat. Just fold it over on itself several times um, and you'd be able to measure three different colors. The trouble is we can't use a standard lookup because the amount of spacing on that is going to change depending if, if that's one, then we'd be looking for one, two, and three, and they'd be sort of scaled up and down. But this is, this is my own uh, invention, is using the slide rule trick to do a lookup of this without using a computer at all. Um, slide rule trick, so refresher. Slide rules make multiplication easy um, because they've got a couple of logarithmic scales that slide past each other. And the reason why slide rule works at a deep level is log A plus log B equals log AB, and sliding a scale past something implements addition extremely easily. Um, so if you have a known offset there and a known offset there, then that's addition of those two. Um, we can use that trick. So we've got our three cross polarizers. If we plot that color scale in a logarithmic fashion, then regardless of how much actual birefringence there is, these three will always be offset by a constant amount. So we can just make a little laser cut template and move it across the thing until we find the three colors that match. And that's orange, purple, blue, boom, boom, boom. Okay, great, we found it. So no computers, no nothing, no expensive calibrated objects. And you've just found the precise amount of birefringence of your plastic for your process. Um, so that's pretty much it. I've got a bunch of objects if people want to come and have a play. Um, if anyone is interested in how any of these are calculated, I can, I'm very happy to share the code. Uh, there's, uh, there was a MATLAB script to make this. There was a bunch of Python scripts to make the other things. Um, and we can do some titanium, titanium anodizing if anyone wants to do that. So. Cheers. Yeah. Question. Yes. Is this a hobby of yours or is this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. This isn't part of your business. No, 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 no. This is just me seeing Puddle one day and going, oh, that's pretty cute. What, what can I do with that? You know, wow. <laughs> what causes that? Yeah. Well, that's quite a... That's, so you have a problem. Right you have a problem. Yes. <laughs> so what is your day job then? Um, engineering. My training's robotics, but um, oh. I have chemical plants, steel mills, that sort of thing. Control what engineering. kind of engineer? Yeah. Uh, my training's robotics, but <laughs> automation and controls and stuff. But physics is my hobby. Um, and oh, if anyone's interested, we were talking about quantum stuff before. If anyone wants to see a, uh, a demonstration of how that, uh, that split would occur um, in, a, in a quantum sense, I'll, I'll bust out a diagram and show that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. One, yeah. One more question. Yeah, yeah. If a person is colorblind. Yes. What What's wrong? That's a really good. That's a really really good question. Um, I was going to bring in a, a thing today, but I couldn't find where it's actually in the house. Uh, okay, so I'm going to use this one because it's no that one. Okay, um, yeah, that's a really good question. So I'm going I'm to focus on red green color blindness. There's actually about ten different types of color blindness you can have, um, but red green is the most common, um, and basically what what happens if someone's red, green, color blind? I'm pretty sure that's deuteranopy, something like that. Um, they still have, they still have the receptors. They still have the wiring. There, there are still three channels going to the brain. But when the eye grew, um, the I want to say rhodopsin uh, complex, the absorption function of the pigments in the eye 
is slightly different because the shape of the, the proteins is, is um, you know, genetically coded to be different. And basically the, 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 off, the offshoot of all of that is that these two peaks are kind of close together. So they still have three channels, they still have three sensing apparatus happening. It's just that from the brain's point of view, they're mostly singing the same song. Uh, so there's very little difference in, in what it can extract in terms of bits of information from that. So it's as though the two channels are shorted together. Exactly, yeah. They're not shorted, but they're just, they're, there's like a, a huge correlation. So giving the same information. Yeah. There's a, so what causes that? Is it a genetic, genetic thing, I'm pretty sure. Beg your pardon? A genetic thing, I'm pretty sure. I see. Um, and which is, is pretty much everything. Genetics is why the, the eyes can grow right in the first place, I guess. Um, but the, the actual, the absorption of the, the proteins in the retina is coded uh, by the shape of the protein and that's coded by the genes in the first place so I think it's I think it's just a, like a, a, a genetic thing if you look at different animals they have absorption functions in different places as well um, and you can actually track lineages of different animals and see where like they've lost one or they've gained one like they, they and usually when they gain one it's like a they accidentally make a double copying of one and then the, the double copying suddenly migrates over you know, millions of years or whatever. So you can see where, I think we have one less receptor than some of the great apes do. I can't remember. There was something about that. Some of the birds can see UV because the urea yeah. and urine um, is a UV. Right. Um, it's visible in UV, so I can see the trails where animals have been um, pissing. And bees and things are, are, are really great at so, seeing in UV. Yeah. So that, that's a function for the human, is, so they derive similar ones for animals. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You can do any any creature. You could drive that, and and people that are colorblind, you can drive it as well. Yeah, there's an application of this. Yeah, they can't see colors or colorblind. I'm not sure. Um, I think I can't remember if dogs just have. Dogs can't. I believe dogs yeah. can see color. They just yeah. can't see red. Right. Apparently, a lot of the uh, great apes and so on, because we eat. A lot of plant material. Yeah, yeah. Be able to see that fruit is ripe. Right. And so we've evolved the ability to see red, whereas dogs, being carnivores, didn't need that. That's less of an issue, so it doesn't give them an evolutionary advantage. Right. Wow. Um, uh, there's a there's an application for this as well. You see red, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that is a myth. Yes. <laughs> What's the actual energy spectrum of light coming from the sun to reach Earth? Okay. Uh, it's it's a six thousand k black body. No, but yeah, it's, is, it's is very it actually flat, or is it mm, stronger than the blue than the red or green? Uh, uh, that, yeah, that's a really really good question. Um, I've got the wrong laptop well, here. Well, blue is more energetic to begin with. Yes. Um, the I think it's fairly flat density as far as across human human ranges. There are little notches taken out because of absorption lines yeah. in the sun. Um, I've, uh, I wish I'd brought it, I wish I'd brought it today, but uh, I took a spectral database of the sun and did a plot of the rainbow show, oh, sorry, did, did a plot of the spectral database of the sun showing the intensity at each different wavelength and then colored it to what a human eye would see and then printed it out on a big roll. And it's uh, 20 meters long. Um, and you can see the absorption lines are still extremely narrow. The sun has a huge amount of information hidden inside it, um, but it's it's fairly flat spectrally across human vision. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty so sure. What causes yeah. those peaks? Is it... uh, these ones? No, no. The oh, in the sun. Um, uh, we're talking about the, um, the 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 awful sodium lamps. Is it the solar atmosphere that's absorbing stuff? Exactly. It? In the same way as a sodium lamp is emitting that, that, that characteristic dual peak, the sun's absorbing that. In the so surface layers. In the surface layers. So it's, it's a hot thing that makes, hot, makes a black, black body. body. Yeah. The and then the, the surface layers are... Exactly. And, it, and, and s the surface layers are absorbing some, and then Earth's atmosphere is absorbing others. It's spitting out gas and... Yeah. You know... Time so a the, the, it's 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 really hot, so it makes a smooth thing. It makes a smooth spectrum of just a really hot object at six thousand Kelvin, and then above that, there's the absorption of of that um, in the sun. And then when it gets to the Earth, then there's absorption lines in there. So it's it starts out smooth by virtue of being very hot, and then becomes lumpy at two different at least two different stages on the way. And if there was a cloud of gas between us, us and the sun, it would also a re a really yeah. Good demo you can do is if you have yeah. a low pressure sodium lamp. 
yes. like, like an old street lamp, and you have a Bunsen burner flame with salt introduced to it, so you've got sodium in the flame. If you look at the, the lamp through the flame, you will actually see the lamp appears not lit through the flame. The will actually that, light. That, that, that is a really good demo, and you can tweak it even better um, if you put a solenoid next to it. Oh, a solenoid, if you put your flame inside a solenoid, uh, an electromagnet, it will cause Zeeman splitting of the sodium atoms, <laughs> and it shuffles the emission line around slightly. So basically, the, the sodium atom, uh, I think it's got a nuclear spin or something, so basically if like, the nucleus and the electron are aligned or anti-aligned, they have a slightly different energy level. And the larger the magnetic field is around it, the, the more those two, the, the difference between the aligned and anti-aligned so become. So you're saying you can control the current and make the land gradually yeah, appear again? Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's a guy called <laughs> Ben, Ben Kres now has a YouTube video doing this exact thing, sodium lamp and then a sodium flame. Um, and and yes, turning it on and off, yeah. <laughs> but that that splitting is how you can do a whole bunch of really cool stuff because we think of emission lines as fixed, but they're actually a little bit flexible sometimes. And you can use this effect. Um, okay, so um, I can make uh, let, let me show you an example of this. So so this is a radio club. You guys are into um, like uh, heterodyning and and that sort of thing in, in radio receivers, right? Let me find. Uh, an example of something that came up the other day. This is totally unrelated to this, but I think you guys are going to love it. Okay, so a laser tube, we'll call this a laser tube. You apply a high voltage to it, and there's a mirror at both ends, and it excites the gas, and then the gas uh, lasers and throws off some photons, and they get amplified, and each lap it gets, you know, amplified, 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 and eventually it's, it's powerful enough to, to break out of the a significant proportion of break out of the mirror and, and become a beam. The, the reason why lasers are really good frequency sources is because the, the gain medium has a, uh, like a, an effective gain curve which is fairly narrow and then the fact that it's, a, it's resonating between two mirrors artificially narrows that even more. So the fact that the, the, fact that the laser is yay wide only supports certain modes of oscillation of the beam yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a spatial filter. It's a cavity filter. It's a cavity filter, yeah, but by virtue of being two mirrors fixed. Um, but the, so it's a combination of the gain medium and the, the cavity supporting modes of oscillation. But you can tweak that. Um, so a normal laser just, just does that. Uh, HP made a, a thing called a 5501, which is an interferometer laser. And it used this magnetic Zeeman splitting. So you wrap magnets around the tube and it splits the gain medium's emission line into two. One that's aligned with the field and one that's anti-aligned with the field. So one's high, slightly higher energy than another. And it's not very much, not very much at all, but that means that two beams are created. One that is lasing on this one, lays, not lays, lays, not lays, lays, not lays, and then burst out. And this one is lasing on the opposite lap. Um, and they have a slightly different energy. So for example, <laughs> Uh, a, a red helium laser, it's, it's a very standard thing, it's 632.8 nanometers, which if we work that out in terahertz, because everything is just frequencies, right? Uh, that's 474.008 terahertz. But the two beams are 474 terahertz, 8 gigahertz, 531 megahertz, and the other beam is 474.008, 533 megahertz. So there's a two megahertz beat between those two laser modes. And if you combine that onto a, like a little a diode or an LDR, you pick up the two megahertz. Mm -hmm. And all it does is just servo a little heater. And when, if the, the two modes are not uh, beating equally, uh, then it, it just makes it a little bit hotter and that expands the mirrors and makes cavity support mm -hmm. a different mode of oscillation. So it's, it's, it's literally just using a heater to control the length of the tube. Um, and they do extremely clever stuff with this to, to, to do interferometry and, and integrate Doppler directly. But essentially it's just they wrap a tube in magnets and the fact that you get splitting of, the, splitting of that emission line into two to, that, are, that are fucking like 474 terahertz with a two megahertz difference. Yeah, that's a subtle, subtle difference of, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's enough for them to use it industrially and that this machine is actually used for 
calibrating uh, mills and CNCs and things like that down in animators. You just you bolt it onto a tripod and then you can you move a, a cube corner reflector around and you can you can calibrate your machine. But it, the whole thing works on that beat frequency and that two megahertz reference. And they do some even more clever stuff in there to to get that operating. And it's all down to Zeeman splitting, which is the same thing as that the the solenoid. So, yeah. That's HP equipment used yeah. physics before yes. they got to more modern equipment made it. Now it's agile and they use computer mm. processing yes. to do it, whereas the old stuff, the classic equipment, does it by the basic by, by, by being very clever and yeah, yeah. That that one is, is extremely it's it's an utterly gorgeous design because the two modes of oscillation have different circular polarization. So you can actually you can rotate it with a wave plane, you can split it out into two different polarizations. And what that means is for your, your interferometer that's calibrating your machine, you have the laser on a tripod, you have your, your uh, reference arm for your cube corner reflector, and then you have your, your cube corner reflector. And basically it measures the distance between this thing and this thing. And it's pretty much invariant to the gap between the laser. Mm. And if you happen to bump the tripod, it doesn't really matter because it's only really measuring the distance between these things. Um, and it's, it's just this, this practical precision and invariance that's unheard of in an interferometer where it's like, no, we've got we to shut the machine down and we're going to wait for two weeks for it to thermally stabilize the room. And no, 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 don't, don't, don't bother doing that. Just, just put it on a tripod. It doesn't really matter. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, you, and that one you can see it like ticking over in nanometers. If you, if you put a, um, what do you call them, little parallels in machining, if you put a parallel down, and you put the mirror next to it, and you put your finger on the parallel, you can see it start ticking up in nanometers because your finger made the parallel hotter and just pushed the mirror away slightly. So it's, it's one of the most sensitive things you this can see. This would have been see. how they measured the um, radius of the uh, silicon ball that they're trying to use for a kilogram standard. Probably. Yeah, this is over at yeah. uh, NMI in Winfield. They um, but it didn't actually become a primary standard because the other one was easy to reproduce. And right. They were, they were equivalent. They, they both reached the equivalent levels of they, required levels of accuracy to replace the kilogram standard at about the same time. You, you can do a really cool thing, which is uh, making a hologram and then doing a live hologram comparison where you have your, your film mechanism and then you reproject it through that. And basically, anything, any difference between the recorded image and the, the image in the field will show up as a big fringe. Um, but the only thing is that it's so sensitive that you really can't take the plate out and develop it and put it back. So you need to come up with ways to develop it in situ by like sort of wafting developing chemicals past this glass plate without disturbing anything else in the environment. And yeah. <laughs> Digression, sorry. If anyone wants to play the dichroic filters here, we've got some titanium stuff. If anyone wants to do some titanium anodizing, we've got some of that. Um, and yeah, I've got a whole bunch of colored pictures and things. Yeah, everyone wants to have a play. Very impressive. Very impressive.